Erasmus was the biggest shitster academic of his age. Yeah. Desiderius Erasmus was a Dutch scholar. Right. And he did a very naughty thing. He went back and looked at the translation of the, the Vulgate, which was the Catholic Bible written in Latin, and yeah, compared okay. it to the Greek original. All right. Because as you know, boys and girls, the Bible was written in Greek because Jesus was Greek. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, ask your yaya or your fear. I got kicked out of my fear's house for saying that Jesus was not Greek. <laughs> and she yeah, said, "That's true." And she said to me, "San Andreas, San Andreas, after that, any communists? I said, "But he was not. He was Jewish." Oh, he, Christos, oh, Christos. Hello once again. Before we get to the hellos, and you had me at hello, I don't think that's been trademarked. You did. <laughs> a note on the name of the show. Another note. Because, well, there has to be, because you don't pay attention to any of the other ones. <laughs> there should be a complaints process. I need to speak to someone. It's that director. I can never find him. But yes, as a director or producer, then maybe that's why they're not <laughs> getting my emails. The point is this, I think. Let's ditch the word Ramaic. Completely. Completely. Okay. Did you come up with anything else? Yeah, ruminations. Just ruminations? Yeah. No Romaic. Just ruminations. Yeah, because my point is this. the It is the fashion among the Greek-Australian community yes. to ditch the ethnic indicator. Oh. So, you know how you have the... It used to be called the Oakley Greek... Glendy or Greek festival. Now it's just yeah. the Oakley Glendy or the Oakley festival. Yeah, Lonsdale because Street word, Festival. Because the word Greek is confronting. And we ha- we think that if we put the word in Greek, somehow everyone else who's not Greek won't like it. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting a lot of complaints from non-Greek people. They're saying, if only you weren't so Romaic, we would watch a show. <laughs> because, as you know, no one's watching the show. No, my, no my cat tried to watch it but found it really inane, so went off and did something else. Wasn't offended, was it? No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. It was too boring and bland to be <laughs> offensive. But we don't need Romaic. We don't need Greek. We don't need Hellenic. It's kind of like how South Melbourne used to be called South Melbourne Hellas, and mm. then they ditched the word Hellas because that was too Greek in yes. order to get into the A-League, but they never got into the A-League anyway. Right. And how the uh, team that I used to no, it was Alexandros, mm-hmm. is called Heidelberg United Warriors, mm. affectionately known as the Burgers. The Burgers. Go, Burgers. <laughs> go. <laughs> Big Mac, quarter pounder, whatever, you, whatever takes your fancy. So being a Greek or having Greek-affiliated terms is offensive to Greeks. Mm. And if you want to fit in, if you want to be a real success, like South Melbourne and uh, the Burgers are, and the right. Oakley Glendale okay. are, yep. mm-hmm. you have to get rid of the word Greek. And we don't have the word Greek, we have the word Romaic, and no one knows what that means. No, nobody it's does. It's not you. Mm. So let's just call it ruminations. Just ruminations. And then ruminations is really Australian because of the word ru. <laughs> and I think, th- I, think that we will, I think that we will increase our uh, audience threefold, so from zero to three. Right. And that will be good. And, okay. then, and then finally, that algorithm, that elusive YouTube algorithm yes. that we keep on talking about, <laughs> will take notice of us and send us a box of chocolates. Just by, just by being, just by giving the word, rid of the word Romaic. Yeah, get rid of it. We're not ethnic here, Pete. We don't, we don't do the ethnic thing. No. We refuse to be stereotyped. Absolutely. We're not monoethnic. We're polyethnic. Multicultural. Look, I'm into all sorts of kinky stuff, but I draw the line at that. <laughs> okay. Let's just get right into it because uh, going through the Facebook posts again and this time, bang, you posted this and it just looks weird. Why? Why does that look weird to you? I don't know. It just looks weird. It, It looks like a snake with the head of 
a lion. Before you're there, this is a family show, Ms. on Fire. <laughs> you can switch off now if you want. <laughs> it just it just looks like I don't know. It just looks like the a snake with a, like a cow's head, but with long flowing locks and woman's hair. This is Warwick Kappa before the <laughs> surgery. <laughs> There's a reference. Boys and girls, there's you don't a know reference. Who Warwick Clapper is, so that's okay, and uh, we won't explain it. Now, there's a reference. <laughs> okay, what we're looking at here, Pete, okay. is explain the brilliance this. of ancient Greece. Now, ancient Greece is that place where people used to walk around wearing sheets and being really rational, mm. and all of us after that, just, it's a hard act to follow. We're all debased, degraded um, descendants of these brilliant people who were not worthy of the memory. And, of course... What one of them did, he was a particularly enterprising person called mm-hmm. Alexander, yeah. not Alexander Heidelberg, but Alexander <laughs> of Avon. Not a burger. Of no, it wasn't a burger. Burgers hadn't been invented. Oh, they were right. invented by Spiro in America afterwards. What happened was this. This guy is in Paphlagonia, which mm-hmm. is the northwestern coast of the Black Sea, uh, Asia Minor, so mm-hmm. next to a place called Pontus that no one's ever heard of. No one ever and has, no. He decides to set up a religion. Okay. And he gets a pet python and he gets a paper mache mask and puts it on it in the shape of a lion. And then he goes out into the marketplace and says, this is the god Glaucon. And Glaucon will protect you from everything if you pray to Glaucon and if you give it a lot of money. And people rushed to Glaucon. And Glaucon had movable parts, the, the mask. And, right. Uh, he was a ventriloquist, uh, Alexander, and he would give you chrismi, uh, oracles, and he would solve all your problems. And at that stage, kind of like now, there was a massive plague raging through the uh, through the Mediterranean. It was called the Plague of Galen because the ancient Greek doctor Galen described its symptoms. This thing started in China, sounding familiar, boys and girls, <laughs> and spread all around the known world, and not the unknown world, we don't know what happened there, and ravaged the eastern Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. So if you pray to Glaucon, according to Alexander, right. you would be protected from the plague. And they've actually found archaeological discoveries, houses that they've excavated in Syria, where there are passages written over the door sill uh, trying to propitiate Glaucon to save people from plague. He was also pretty good for childbirth. Right. And As far as were, Romania? Well, yes, because this particular statue was found in Romania. And it, underneath the Bucharest metro... Right. which is where all great statues are found. <laughs> and it's even on their currency. <laughs> and you find this statue in Greece, you'll find it in uh, Syria, you'll find it all over the, uh, what? the Mediterranean. What year we're talking about here? Well, we're talking during the Roman Empire. Oh, during the Roman Empire. So he does that. Mm. He gets to marry the Roman prefect's daughter. Well, okay. He makes a lot of money. He's really powerful. And this sock puppet creator yeah, who the sock puppet turned, man. It, turned sock his... Sock puppet man. It was, a, it was a class act. Wow. He even convinced one of the emperors, Mark, Marcus Aurelius actually, believed in the sock puppet. No. And put, yes. No. And put... No way. Hang on. Marcus Aurelius, the guy who wrote Meditations. Father of a murdered son. Or was it the other way around? <laughs> Father of a murderer who murdered no, the son. No, no, no. Father of a murdered son, husband of a murdered wife. Maximus Decius Meridius was one of his guys. <laughs> and he put, he put the picture, the, the depiction of Glaucon on coins. So you see coins circulating in the Roman Empire. Marcus Aurelius. Yes. They're there. He believed in him. Got sucked in. Well, people The worship, man of stoicism. No, 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 no. People worship Kim Kardashian. Why can't we worship a sock puppet? Oh. <laughs> okay. I believed that the Cookie Monster was real up until the age of six. Yeah. Man, the Cookie Monster. Hello, yeah. me, Alistair Cookie. <laughs> Welcome to Monster Piece Theatre. Tonight, we talk about Sock Puppet. <laughs> that was sort of going to Yoda territory. I, that, that happens. I think Yoda and, and uh, Cookie Monster related. So what happens is that he becomes very rich, very powerful, and of course, if there were some lovely, good-looking, troubled ladies who needed some extra guidance... Uh, you could go around the back and he would give you one-on-one uh, oracle treatment. And the only reason we know about this mm-hmm. is because there's this, apart from the excavations, which are few and far between, there was a great comedic writer called Lucian of Samosata. 
He was a Syrian. He, okay. was a, he was a Syrian and he wrote in Greek. And he's written a whole, um, if you like, treatise on this guy and what a fraud he was and wow. the problems that he had. And this thing circulated at that time. Right. And he claims that Alexander tried to have him knocked off because he was defaming him and ruining his act. Now, Alexander was considered to be a god by his followers and his cult lasted for about 100 to 200 years after his death. After his death? So you had Greek devotees of the sock puppet. Well, do you know what? It doesn't... I I see you with your perfectly trimmed eyebrows (laughs) poised in a pose of disbelief and I say to myself, look, it's only a conceptual leap of one syllable from sock to pasok. (laughs) <laughs> oh, come on. It is. And if one is plausible, why can't the other be plausible? 200 years, and though. And you know, well, no, I, mean, I don't think, I don't think I boys think, and girls of Pasok will last, last for not 200, 200 years. years. It may, because some of these people <laughs> refuse to die, but there you go. I wonder how many of our uh, audience know who, what a Pasok is. We can talk about that another time. Another time, yeah. when they're really, really bored, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, when did he die? Oh, this would have been about 150 AD, somewhere around there. Around there. there. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So, moving on. Uh, that's an interesting thing with the sock puppet. Speaking of um, charismatic leaders, mm-hmm. what's what's this post about? Stalin. Yes. Stalin. Well, we all know who he is. Well, at least I hope most people know. Uh but why did you post Sorry, this? I'm just mesmerised. <laughs> is it the moustache? It is the moustache. Isn't it's it? Moustache. It's a great moustache. Your, your moustache is prodigious, but it pales in comparison oh, to please. the great leaders. I would, I would kill for a, well, a moustache. <laughs> Literally. Go to Gula. But he didn't need to. But he did. He had the moustache already. I would kill for a moustache, but he already had it. Now, in case you don't know, mm. Stalin... Stalin, everybody, everybody, Stalin. <laughs> and um, Stalin was a lovely man who lived in Soviet Russia. Mm. and uh, Georgian by birth, right? Ge- Georgian mm. by birth, mm. which means that he wore a Pondian Zipka. Mm. Because that's what, you know, Pondians think that, like in everything, Pondians think that they're original. The Pondian costume comes from Georgia. Uh, you, and that's you, what they wear. You posted the a video of a particular Georgian recently as well. Anyway, we, he di- was a we particular, He was a particular Georgian. Now, during the time of Stalin, there were mm. many Greeks living in Russia, mm-hmm. and especially along the Black Sea region. So we're talking the uh, coastline of the Ukraine and the coastline of the Caucasus. And a lot of them had been there for hundreds of years. Yeah. And uh, many of them had migrated to those regions when Catherine the Great took those regions from the Turks mm. and then opened up those lands for settlement. Right. And she offered the Greeks 10 years t- uh, fr- freedom from taxation, Okay. And certain lands, if they would go and settle there, and they did in droves, uh, fleeing the Ottoman Empire. Yep. They were free. They could practice their religion. They could do whatever they wanted. Mm. And they created very wealthy and strong and tightly knit communities. And these communities uh, later on banded together to create the Filikieteria, which was created in Odessa. And we know what happened after that. Greek Revolution, support, everything else. Yes. So very, very important insofar as Hellenism is concerned. Mm-hmm. Come the Bolshevik Revolution, mm-hmm. a lot of the 1917, a lot of yep. these people are still there. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, they remain, and then there's this idea, well, what do we do? There was a linguistic problem because it was considered that the old orthography with the Catharevusa, with the Perispomenus, with the uh, yeah. g- tones, accents, everything else was mm-hmm. outdated. Okay. Russian is one of those languages which is pronounced the way it is written, Yes, sort of, although they have hard and soft uh, vowels and consonants that yes. change depending on what's before, but that's not mm-hmm. another point. And the idea was let's refilm the alphabet and let's make every letter sound for a sound. And you can see that here. This is a book which was published by the Soviet Union for use f- uh, of Greek school children living in Soviet Russia. So the m- most apparent thing from the beginning mm-hmm. is even though this is 1920s, yeah, there are no accents. No, the the breathings. Okay, so the siapsili, all these things. Gone. Right, yes. No perispomenus, no. none of that. There's just one tone the way it is now. Yeah. Second, there's no ita. So we have ita to denote a female. That's gone. Epsilon yota to denote a verb. Gone. You just have one sound for e, which is yota. 
Now, the alpha yota, which we use for air, also mm-hmm. gone. We just have epsilon for air. There's no sigma, mm-hmm. middle sigma. We have the middle sigma, and then we have the final sigma, which yes. is like the, yeah. it's just the final S for sigma. And they've introduced, if you can have a look, a double sigma, which is the sound sh. So, Australian or Bolshevikos. Ah. They actually said Bolshevikos. They put the tone in the wrong place, but it doesn't matter. And what they're doing is they're trying to render Greek phonetically. If you have a look, soloton kosmo with a zeta instead of sigma, the way it would be in, in the Greek that we know. Right. It's kosmo. They're trying to create, they're doing two things. They're trying to render the language the way it's written. Mm-hmm. And they're also trying to differentiate linguistically the Greeks in Russia from the Greeks in Greece because they don't want these two people to communicate. They did that with other people as well. Stalin was very good at this. He changed the Azerbaijani alphabet from an Arabic alphabet into a Latin one and then the Cyrillic one. And he also did that with all the Central um, Asian Turkish republics who wrote in a form of Persian script. Right. He changed that to first Latin and then to Cyrillic. Wow. To separate them from their past, from all the other speakers of the languages in the areas not under his control in order to isolate them and to create something different. So there were communities that resisted this, especially in the Ukraine. Mm-hmm. In Pondos, it was very popular, in Novorossiysk and places like that. Right. But in the end, it didn't matter because in 1937, Stalin conceived of the Grecheskaya Operatia, mm. where he said, you know what, Greeks are untrustworthy. We don't like Greeks. Mm. We're going to remove them. So he rounded up all the Greeks from the Caucasus yeah. and sent them into Central Asia in exile yeah. because they were fifth columnists. Mm. And uh, that's why you had Greeks in Kazakhstan, and you had Greeks in Uzbekistan, in a place which was completely different and alien from where they were. Mm. And uh, the rest is history, if you like. They remained there right up until the fall of the Soviet Union, or at least until the 70s when there was an agreement reached between Greece and the Soviet Union. A lot of them returned to Greece. Well, not really returned because they'd never lived in Greece. Yes, that's right. Yeah, But they they were sent to the Greek motherland. The many that I know uh, that I've met, uh, same situation back in 91, 92, yeah. When the wall when the wall came down, uh, they just migrated. Well, we over. have people in uh, living here in our community who come from there. Yeah, but I remember reading about what the Greeks went through um, in the in the thirties, and I just couldn't believe that after um, a genocide, they have to relive the whole thing again. Just oh, well, this two is decades the problem later. when you don't recognize genocides, you embolden people to do them again. Hmm. And if you have a look, so this is not about genocide, though. No. The ypsilon sounds for an U, just as it does in, in the Russian alphabet. So they're, they're sort of that's trying to streamline. So that there is bandu. Yeah, that's bandu, not bandi, which is ah. what your natural reaction would be. The, they're doing this, and the point of all of this is to show that there are various forms of writing Greek. You mm. know, we, we complain about the Greek leash. No one were trying to write Greek with Roman letters on the internet because our systems don't support... They do now, but before they didn't. They mm. don't support fonts, and everyone was writing in symbol, and no one could understand what everyone was saying. And there are various other uh, ways of writing Greek. That's one of them. And that's a very old thing. For example, the idea of using the Greek alphabet to render sounds which aren't in Greek yeah. uh, was uh, conceived by the Indians. The Greco-Bactrian kingdom in northern India, mm-hmm. they would have the letter th, which is also in the Icelandic languages, which mm-hmm. is like a rod with a little gap on it Okay. for sh. They use that for sh. Okay. So you have the king avrokshu. It's all written in Greek with that extra letter. Just, uh, just doubling it up like and that. And that. Uh, that, that was in the the Hellenistic times. Wow. So we are a versatile people, Pete. We are. Our own and we adapt. And we discuss yeah. that uh, So thank you, camera. Stalin. Let's just not go too far. <laughs> I always thank Stalin. At least twice a day. You never know who's watching. The only thing that I will give in on is the moustache. But as for him, oh, gee. All right. Um, moving on. Speaking of bastards. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, by, the way, never... by the way, we, we do not in any way seek to deride people based on their legitimacy on this program. We're a family show. This is a safe space. And Mm. uh, what people do and how they're born is none of our business. Stalin was a bastard. I'll just tell you that right now. 
Yes, and this and bastards seem to be the um, the theme of this show because yes, yes. I've never heard including of including the ones that present it. <laughs> I've never heard of this guy. He's a bastard. His name is Steve Gardner. All right, and so uh, it doesn't sound like a Russian name. So we're not talking about someone from Russia, right? No, Steve Gardner. Stephen Gardner ended up being a bishop, but before he was a bishop, mm. he was the chancellor of Cambridge University. Okay, so and far, okay. Well, he would be a bastard if he doesn't let you in, would he? <laughs> Cambridge is one of the greatest universities. That's right. <laughs> would be better if it was from Oxford. Now, oh, we're going to go into that. No, 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 you know what? Let's not go on. No. Moving on. <laughs> 1543 or thereabouts, because yeah. my memory is a bit hazy, Yeah, and I'm slurring in my speech because I just had a uh, sparkling mineral water. You know what that was <laughs> yeah, it throws you off. It does. He uh, issued a directive, because mm. you could do that back in the day, Right. saying that any student caught reading ancient Greek with the Erasmian pronunciation will be flogged. Okay. Now, I conjure up images of Greek students at La Trobe yeah. being flogged in order to study Greek, <laughs> yeah, well. let alone being flogged for reading Greek, you know? In Erasmian... Uh, okay. Erasmus was the biggest shitster academic of his age. Yeah. Desiderius Erasmus was a Dutch scholar. Right. And he did a very naughty thing. He went back and looked at the translation of the, the Vulgate, which was the Catholic Bible written in Latin, and yeah, compared okay. it to the Greek original. All right. Because as you know, boys and girls, the Bible was written in Greek because Jesus was Greek. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, ask your yeah. Or your Thea, I got kicked out of my Thea's house for saying that Jesus was not Greek. <laughs> and she yeah, said, I remember this thought. That's true. And she said to me, San Andrepes, San Andrepes, after that, any communist, I said, but he was not, he was Jewish. Oh, he, Christos, oh, Christos. Yeah, that's right. That explains everything. I, I said this to a couple of my friends, and they said, You are lying. This is just one of your flights of fancy. Go away. <laughs> and I said, No, go off and try. And they all came back and said, oh, my God, they all think that Jesus was Greek. Wow. So okay. on a point of clarification, Jesus was not Greek, mm -hmm. but the Bible was written in Greek. <coughs> Excuse me. Why do you sneeze <laughs> during a podcast when we mention the Bible? <laughs> Heretic! Heretic! <laughs> okay, giving you a chance to recover right. after we burn you in effigy, we'll say this. Yes. If so Erasmus Erasmus, Erasmus retranslates the Bible right into Latin yeah. from the Greek mm -hmm. and all hell broke loose throughout Europe. This was one of the most mind-bending, catastrophic, cataclysmic events of his age because all of a sudden people are challenging the official text of the Catholic Church saying, hang on, you mean you've been teaching us the wrong thing for how many hundreds of years? What the hell is this? Mm. And it's undermining the authority of the Church and people are upset. Other people are thrilled, and it is the first time that Greek is used as a language of emancipation wow. throughout Western Europe. And he's pushing scholars to read Greek and he's saying, don't take my word for it. Go off and learn Greek. It's very important. So he's studying Greek. He's forcing others to study Greek. Yeah. He inspires people to study Greek. And all of a sudden, Greek is the hottest thing on the curriculum. And that hasn't happened since prior to the schism of the churches and everything else in 1054. Wow. You know that one of the reasons for the schism between the East and the Western churches was that people weren't didn't speak each other's language Correct. anymore. They weren't communicating on a intellectual level, yeah. and they were using approximations of the same words, but they didn't understand the nuances of those words because they weren't across the languages. Yeah. So Erasmus brings that back and says, "Hey, Greek is important. Greek should be part of the Western curriculum." Mm. It's the first time that, that happens for a very long time. And he's Dutch. He's Dutch. He's from Holland. Isn't that weird? <laughs> and. So he does this. He does this. And the other thing that he does, and, and people are really upset about this, there are, there are scholars in England who want to ban Greek altogether because right. they consider it subversive. They consider that it's challenging the status quo. Now, this is during what year? Well, this is in the 1500s. 1500. So we've already had Martin Luther. He's come through already. Martin right? Luther hated him. Martin, Martin Luther, Luther hated, Erasmus. hated Erasmus. And Erasmus used to pick on him because Martin Luther had no sense of humour. <laughs> And he would, he it was would German, say, right? <laughs> no, he did things like he would say about Thomas Aquinas, who was a Catholic theologian, yeah. he would call him Aristotelicotatos, Aristotelian to the max, because Thomas Aquinas had no Greek and couldn't read Aristotle. So do you think it was just a 
that's funny if you're an academic. <laughs> I'm not an academic, so I don't find it funny. Pete wants to be an academic, so he's pretending to laugh. Yeah, now, pretending. He does this, and the other thing he does is he examines mm-hmm. the sounds of the, of the Greek language. Mm-hmm. Because up until now, those few people who are reading ancient Greek are being helped by Greek refugees who are fleeing the fall of Byzantium, right. and they're adopting the phonology the way that we speak Greek today. It's very mm-hmm. similar. It hasn't changed for about 500 years. The All sounds. Right. The sounds. But he looks at that and analyzes that and says, no, nah, this can't have been the way that ancient Greek spoke. The All ancient right. Greek was not a tonal language, according to him. It was more of a musical language. Yeah. Um, the Ypsilon, there's no reason why there should be an Ypsilon, a Yota, and an Ita all sounding the same. Mm. So he was the first person that said that Yota was I, Ypsilon was U, which is why the sound U, pronounced in French, is uh, called Y, the Greek Y. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. And uh, I, which uh, I, Ita, yeah. he says should have been pronounced E. Eh. Yeah. And you can see that in Pondian. In yeah. places where the Ita is pronounced in modern Greek, they say E. Eh. Yeah. Okay? Mm. So he he says that. He also says the Dacia, the rough breathing that goes on top of the, uh, the uh, first mm-hmm. vowel in some instances, like... Is a H, and that was true. Like, hydros, he would have been hydros in ancient Greek. Wow. So he introduces this whole way of. How did he figure all that out, Dean? Well, he had a lot of spare time. There was no internet, <laughs> there were no phones, there was no maths. Yeah, there but was absolutely you, no How maths. do you then pick up, like, some text and say, well, you know what, this. It should have sounded like that. Did he speak to anybody? He did, he did. There was, there was a whole train of inquiry. Anyway, all right. so he writes about this, and it's really influential. Mm-hmm. And all of these students in uh, Cambridge and Oxford start reading Greek with that pronunciation, what we know as the Erasmian pronunciation. Mm-hmm. And Stephen Gardner got really upset and said, this sounds disgusting, and anyone who I hear saying this will be whipped. And I agree with him. <laughs> I agree with him on so many levels. First of all, it does sound horrible uh, when you hear people reading ancient Greek instead of ge, they're saying kai. And also, I studied ancient Greek yes. at Melbourne University. Yes. There, was no, there were no floggings there unless you liked them. You were into that kind of thing. There were clubs for that, but that's another story. And all of these people would use the Erasmian pronunciation, mm-hmm. and I found it really frustrating. I couldn't do it, so I had to apply for special dispensation. Of course to, you did. To read the ancient Greek with the modern Greek pronunciation, mm. which I'm still not convinced the Rasmus was right, but that's another story, in order to facilitate my learning the language. Because this is what you do when you're a Greek, modern Greek. You go to the first class and they're learning the alphabet, go, ah, da 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 Lufa, lufa, lufa. We are talking about Luther before. And so I didn't turn up to the other three classes, and by that stage they learned the alphabet, they were doing com- uh, grammatical constructions, they left me far behind, so I had to <laughs> go and read and study and keep up. But yeah, so Stephen Gardner whipping everyone to shape, whipping us really good. Can I, um, can I ask, uh, your lecturers at university, would they be pronouncing the, um, uh, the Greek uh, with the... The Erasmian. Er, but not just the Erasmian, but um, call it... Anglo of Erasmian, course, of course, Anglo Erasmian. That's the only way to do it because <laughs> the only, the only valid and decent ancient Greek scholars must be Anglo, because they're in control of the discourse. They, were the, that they is, are in control of how we that learn is the Greek. only time I've ever heard ancient Greek. You have to send me a few videos. Are any Greek speaking in ancient Greek in the Erasmian uh, accent? No, because we don't do that. Because we've got a different narrative. Our narrative stresses the continuity of the Greek language. Okay, so we don't do that. All right. Now, still would have liked to actually hear it, but anyway, um, moving on to the okay. next thing. Um, this is very interesting, if you say so. Now, what I find interesting about this is that uh, how old is this letter? Well, this is fifteen hundreds as well. Yeah, so we're sort of in Mid the same fifteen hundreds, same era here. So right? Henry the Eighth has died. Thank God, say all the ladies <laughs> holding their necks. Yeah, and hey, he was a great. Only two of his six wives got beheaded. There was a pun there, but I'm not going to talk about it. I'm suppressing the pun about heads. But he, Henry VIII, was a great classical scholar. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elizabeth I, his daughter, was Mm. also a great scholar Mm. who studied Greek. And so did her brother, King Edward, who wasn't on the throne for very long. Arthur. 
No, no, no. Edward. Edward. King Edward. Henry was succeeded by Edward. No, oh, sorry. Arthur was, sorry. You're right. You're right. Arthur was um, Edward, he, King Henry VIII's older brother. That's right. The one yeah. that died. Yeah. Sorry. That's okay. It's a, it's a complicated story. <laughs> the... Uh, and because they were great scholars and by because by that stage learning Greek was so highly prized, mm-hmm. the students of various well-to-do grammar schools would write letters to King Edward and Queen Elizabeth in Greek. And these are copies. Okay, so these are, these are uh, English uh, subjects. These are, these are English students in prestigious grammar schools of mm-hmm. the 15, mid-1500s. Mm-hmm. This one we're writing to Queen Elizabeth and you can see there, Ilisavitha, they're calling it Ilisavitha. Yes, see which that. Which is interesting because Elizabeth exists in the Bible as Elisavet, which is why we call it Elisavet in Greek. Mm-hmm. But that's okay, Ilisavitha, and then various other uh, things that they're saying there. But the peaceful menace and so forth there too, don't they? Ktis Ilios es it selinin, so she's being compared to the uh, the sun and the moon, which I think is a very good thing. You don't want to upset your sovereign, especially there when they have the power of life and death over you. So that's a letter which is a poem which was written by the kids of a school and I reckon that was in order for searching for funding. The master, you know, send this to the queen. Let's see if she drops us a purse of jewels or something so we can build the gymnasium. <laughs> that's the way it used to be in, the, in those days. So um, can I ask a question with regards to the, the grammar that's actually used here? This is the Attic grammar of the uh, 5th century. Attic grammar of and the 5th you, century. There, there are certain scholars of that period that say, the only Greek mm-hmm. is the Greek of the 5th century. Everything else is a debasement. Okay. So they, they didn't want to read anything else. And all they liked was that period. Why? And the Attic dialect, because they considered that the pinnacle of civilization. Uh, you know, Periclean, uh, the Periclean times. So they're, they're basically writing the language of Pericles here. And of course, the language has evolved by then and done huge things. Mm. But this is this is the standard, and that was always the prestige language. You had fourth century fathers of the Orthodox Church writing in Attic Greek, even though that was no longer spoken, because that was considered the best, purest, uh, most sophisticated form of Greek. When did all that change? Well, it changed over time slowly. But you had that Attic thing happening all till the form of till the fall of Byzantium where if you wanted to show how smart you were, you would speak like that, you would write like that. Okay. Fascinating. So, um, and, and, uh, and not not uh, diverting too much, but uh, very quickly, with regards to the Greek that's used um, in church, and church literature today? No, this is an, a more ancient form. This is the Attic. The church is the Kini, which emerged during the Hellenistic times after uh, Alexander the Great. So very different. Okay. All right. The Guinea Greek that you hear in church, mm-hmm. if you sometimes, because the chants are very long, the words tend to meld one into the other and your mind wanders. But if you see it written on the page, you'll understand most of it. Right. It's intelligible to a speaker of modern Greek. Okay. All right. So uh, we're going to get a little uh, more serious here because um, going back to uh, going back to – Dates and on this day and what have mm-hmm. you, we have the uh, the twenty first of April, right? My daughter's birthday. Your daughter's yeah, birthday. That's my daughter's birthday. <laughs> congratulations. I think that's the only. Well, it's got nothing to do with me. Actually, it does have a lot to do with me. <laughs> yes, congratulations, <laughs> me. The nothing else happened of importance on that day. Nothing you know at who all. Who said that quote? Who? That was King George the Third, on the day that the American Revolution was proclaimed. Right. He was in London. Mm-hmm. Obviously, didn't know. He was writing in his diary. Nothing of any importance happened today. He wrote that in his diary. Yeah. Okay. King George the Third of England. Next to his notes for Uber, you find that one. <laughs> Seventeen seventy-six. He writes that. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. So this is um, the twenty-first of April. Is um, uh, the what we call the junta, right? So when we talk a little bit about what that is, the junta, yeah. So you got to pronounce the ch- the junta. The word is actually what the word Spanish. Yeah, it's word Spanish yeah. and it's spelt with a J. It's actually yeah. junta. Junta. You hear a lot of Australians say, "Oh, you know, well, what were you people doing during the junta?" <laughs> yeah. And my response is, oh, "I wasn't nothing, doing nothing. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> nothing of interest. Nothing of interest happened that day." <laughs> now the junta or junta. Mm or dictatoria, or however else you want to uh, Mm. call it, is a very, very, very sad and ridiculous period 
in modern Greek history. Right. It okay. didn't have to happen, and it did because of Cold War paranoia. And it happened because the CIA, and this has been discovered through the research that a very courageous and incisive journalist called Alexandros Papagelas has done okay. in the CIA archives, mm-hmm. decided that the democratic forces in Greece were a Cold War risk. Okay. And we're referring to Yorgos Papandreou Sr. Mm-hmm. Yorgos Papandreou Sr. is called Ogerondas Dimokratias, the grandfather mm-hmm. of democracy, because mm-hmm. after the uh, Germans left Greece, he was the first person to raise the flag, oh. the, the Greek flag over okay. the Acropolis. And uh, he was an interesting politician because he was kind of a prototype for his father, Andreas Papandreou, founder of Pasok Papa. <laughs> so he was very charismatic. Mm. Very interesting. He was uh, or originated in the Venizelos faction. Okay. So he was one of Venizelos's people mm. back in the day. And then he went off on his own after Venizelos died and all mm-hmm. those things. And he loved promising things. He would say, I love being in opposition because I can say and do whatever I want and I'm not accountable. <laughs> it was that kind of guy. But he did have some was. points that he was, uh, one of them was opening up the democracy. Okay. Because it was the Cold War. There was the problem with the king at the time Mm -hmm. who was uh, meddling continuously with the constitution with political affairs. And this is something that all the prime ministers of Greece had to deal with and found them annoying, including Karamanlis, Konstantinos, Mm -hmm. the first, who really, really had a bad relationship with uh, Queen Frederica, the last king's mother, because of the meddling of the king. Kings could appoint their own prime ministers. They meddled with with the elections. They meddled with... The parties, they they meddled with appointments. It was really annoying. Yeah, it's a very funny thing. We tend to think, because we're born and raised here, I tend to think of kings having being limited in power pretty much the same way, you know, the Queen is. And even though the Queen can dismiss a Prime Minister tomorrow, uh, usually Prime Ministers are appointed by Cabinet, aren't they? So if she, even if she, dis, you know, she can't appoint her own, can in she? In Greece, back in the day, the King could refuse to appoint someone. Okay. So it was a problem. Mm. Now, there was a situation in 1967 mm. where there were elections and Yorgos Papandreou was poised to win. Mm. The problem with that was that his son, Andreas Papandreou, mm-hmm. a uh, American-educated economics professor, yeah. was going to win as well. And, Alex- and uh, he was considered very radical, very out there, and a security risk. Okay. The CIA did not want that party to win. The king did not want that party to win. The king was already, King Constantine, Mm -hmm. the last king of Greece, was already in negotiations with America about staging a coup of his own to prevent the elections to stop him from winning because they didn't get on. Right. The Americans told him, no, wait, you can't do this coup. Didn't tell him why. The reason why was because they were already talking to a few colonels in the Greek army who had formed a group previously called Aspida, and they were very pro-American, very anti-Bolshevik, very uh, Mm. anti-discussing opening up the country to democracy, anything like that. Mm -hmm. They had been behind political murders in the past, including the murder of uh, peace activist Grigorios Lambrakis in the early 60s. He was a peace activist, and he was murdered by that group. And that's where you get that famous movie uh, Z or Z. Yes. So it's got to do with that. Right. And these colonels seize power on the 21st of April, 1967. And they're a farcical and stupid bunch of people. <laughs> and uh, indeed, Eleni Vlachu, who was the owner of the Kathimerini newspaper, yeah. uh, called uh, one of them a clown. And the resu- as a result of that, she was put under house arrest. Right. How, how petty is that? You call someone a clown. She called Stylianos Patakos, who was one of the colonels, right. a clown, house arrest. She actually fled mm. uh, and went to London. Right. And from there, along with Melina Mercuri, mm. who we all know from her activism with the Parthenon and mm. her film Never on a Sunday, mm. she also went to London. She had her citizenship stripped away from her by the colonels because wow. of her anti-junta activism. Yeah. Now, the colonels were a particularly dense and stupid bunch of people. So the first thing they did was that they banned public gatherings yes. of more than three people. I remember my uncle telling me this. You know, social distancing was invented by <laughs> us boys and girls, not by Dan Andrews. It was invented by the Hunda. Okay? Because democracy can be a very contagious thing. 
Yeah, you don't want to catch that wall. <laughs> so they do things like that and they propagate this ideology of Elas Elinon Christianon. Greece belongs to Greek Christians. Mm. So everyone else is out of the narrative. Mm. Everyone else has to espouse traditional values. Mm -hmm. Things like adultery was made illegal, even though the head colonel, uh, Yorgos Papadopoulos, was having an affair with another woman, dumped his wife and ended up with her. That was okay. He could do that, but no one else could. Mm. There were restrictions on what could be taught, what you could say. Mm. It was annoying. Mm. And if you were vociferous in your criticism of the regime, you mm. were in prison, you were put under house arrest, you could be tortured, you could be beaten. It was not fun. It's not the kind of thing that you can subject a Greek to for very long because Greeks like to blow off steam. So this thing was a pressure cooker. Mm. We're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting. These things are happening. Um, the other thing they did was they brought back that form of Katharevusa. And Katharevusa was the Greek language which was purified mm. with an infusion of ancient words. Mm. And the funny thing about that was that the colonels couldn't speak it properly. <laughs> so even though they were propagating this, it was full of mistakes. And you remember that famous uh, video a few years ago with one of the golden dawners telling everyone to stand up because their leader, Michal Yakos was coming and said, Eyerthito. Um, and he was using Katharevusa in the wrong sense. It was exactly yeah, that. They didn't know how to speak okay. the language. I it's like buggering up Shakespeare. I don't recall. Yeah, okay. All it's right. like buggering up Shakespeare. I don't recall the video, but I'll take your word for it. Dost thou hath a light, maybe, for chance? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> like so whatever. That, and there's this famous video of Papadopoulos where he's saying, you know, he's likening Greece to a sick person. He's saying, we put the sick person in the cast. We wait to take uh, the cast this. off. Yeah. If the person can walk without a cast, then we won't put a cast on. But mm. if they can't walk, we'll put the cast back on. It just sounds puerile and mm. stupid. And he was referring to the return back to a constitution and democracy when the evils of uh, Bolshevik encroachment would be over. Mm. The vast majority of Greek politicians refused to have anything to do with the Hunda. Karamanis fled to France. Yes. He was there. A lot of the other people went here and then everywhere. Andreas Papandreou, Mm. was allowed to escape. Allowed to escape. He was arrested mm. and uh, the Hunda soldiers put a gun to his son's head. His George. son, George Papandreou yeah. Jr., who also was a Prime Minister of Greece because we like to keep things in the family. Huh? Of course you know, we do. We don't have royal ruling no, families, no, but no, we no, definitely no. have clans. We love rule. dynasties. That's it. Cue, cue theme music? You don't have theme music. <laughs> no, 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 studio, you know what? I'll, find, I'll probably find the sound bite. I think I'll throw should. it in. Throw it in. <laughs> throw it in. So... They do that, and actually there was one of the guys who was advising the junta on behalf of the CIA was Gus Avrakotos. Yeah, you posted a picture you of him would too. Know, you mm. would know Gus from that movie Charlie Wilson's War because he was very big, played a big role in the US involvement in Afghanistan, funding the Mujahideen against the Soviets. But before that, he was posted in Greece, mm. and he was an advisor to the colonels for the CIA. Now, Gus was born in America, but his parents were Greek. They were from Limno. Oh, so he okay. spoke the language, mm -hmm. he got along well with them, and he said to them, the official message of the US government is, yes, let Andreas Papandreou go out into exile, mm -hmm. and he did. The unofficial message is, kill the motherfucker, because you're going to live to regret it, it's going to oh, come back wow, and launch you. Man. Yeah, those words. Not my words, his words. Found that in the CIA archives, I would imagine. Yeah. So, they did this, and... Mm. In the beginning, the Republic works. People saying, okay, if you're a crony, you get employed. Um, mm. Things are happening and people say, oh, don't knock the hunda. The trains were running on time. Things like that. Yeah, I've heard so many. Yeah, which, which for me is not a valid things. point because yeah. the trains always run on time with metro trains. And yet, anyway. <laughs> that happens. The construction then, work, infrastructure all, work. In, well, there in were, the, there in were the attempts Hodiar, to do that. Stuff like that. There were attempts to do that. You get to a stage where... Papadopoulos is seen to be, by the hardliners, too soft. And he keeps on doing <laughs> silly things like talking about a return to elections. Yes. So Ioannidis, Brigadier Ioannidis, mm. has his own little coup, topples mm. Papadopoulos, and he goes on. And he's hardline. He's a fascist. Mm. He's a very scary, nasty individual. And the other thing he decides to do, because the Hyundai is such a great success mm. and everyone loves it so much, yeah. is he decides to export it. So he creates a coup in Cyprus. Yeah. And yeah. he gets yeah. this moron called Samson. 
mm-hmm. to lead the uh, Cyprus junta. Mm-hmm. Makarios goes into exile. He was the leader of Cyprus ever mm-hmm. since the uh, independence, 1960. And, of course, that is the trigger for the Turkish invasion mm. because Turkey is a guarantor power of the independence of Cyprus. The idea is that Greece has compromised the, impen- the independence of Cyprus by toppling the elected government. Mm-hmm. So they exploit the already growing fissures between the two communities, Greek and, and uh, Turkish, mm-hmm. and they land troops on the island. Now, they said it was to restore peace and protect the Turkish population, but yeah. it was a war of conquest, and we brought it upon ourselves because of the junta. Right. Now, when that happened, the regime fell apart. Yeah. The regime collapsed. They had lost all credibility. Mm. The credibility had been uh, compromised a year before with the mm. Politechnia when the students went into the Athens Polytechnic, barricaded themselves in. That was in 74. The that was 73. Three, okay. And that was broken up by tanks. And then there's, there was an argument for years, did people actually die in, mm. during the Politechnia? People on the right say no, they didn't. People on the left say yes, they did. Yeah. And they did. People were killed, crushed yeah. by tanks and what have you. Mm. And uh, that's why every year on the 17th of November, which is when that happened, yeah. we celebrate uh, the death of the students by burnings, graffitiings, and doing all sorts of other stupid vandali- uh, acts of vandalism to that building. That's because excuses, that is, man. That is the way our... Excuses for, be- for behaving like absolute troglodytes. You're a fascist. <laughs> yes, you are. This is how we express our liberal democratic uh, worldviews. Yeah, that's just ridiculous. That. Now, but so that's what happened in the Hunda fell. Mm. It was a very stupid seven years. I think it was Bill Clinton who, when he became president, actually apologised for the CIA's involvement in the coup. Oh, okay. So America did it and up to it and apologised for it before so we were, found the stuff in the CIA. Two, there were two files. American-sponsored coups the one with the colonels which actually happened, Mm -hmm. the one that they were considering with the king that never happened. Right. The king tried to make a comeback because the king in 67... Yeah, so go on. The king in 67 was there when the colonels were sworn in. Yes. And then the king tried to uh, create a counter coup in 1969. And that failed miserably Mm -hmm. and he fled and went to Rome. Mm. And then there was the uh, referendum Mm-hmm. After the Hunda fell, do we bring him back or not? And he mm-hmm. lost that, yeah. which is why I remained in exile. Right. So he was exiled in '69 because of his role in trying to organise the yeah, second yeah. coup. Then in '74, the Greeks basically said, "You know what? We're done with you yeah, anyway. No more, no more kings. So no. we don't have kings anymore. No. Okay. And that's uh, except for Vasilis Garas, <laughs> king of kings. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's it uh, with regards to the um, the 21st. Do we, apart from uh, apart from actually talking about it, is there any are there any ceremonies, anything that the Greeks basically do on the twenty first of April? When you say Greeks, which Greeks here or there? Well, here I don't think we do anything. But oh no, they do, they do. The Mokritos, which is the uh, workers' union, they they usually have an event about that. And I know the Greek schools teach it. Very important. That's why my kids come home from Greek school saying, "So me, pedi." <laughs> yeah. So, no, it is taught, and I think mm. it's important that that's taught. It is a very important part of Greek history. Mm. There was a lot of acti- activism here during that time. That galvanized people. Oh, really? There were protests outside the Greek embassy. Uh, Neos Cosmos, the newspaper, was mm. very, very strongly anti Hunda. Mm hmm. And uh, you, it, it provided a focus for people. Mm. The music of the time, Thodorakis' music, yes. Kotsi singing, it, yes. it really, which is stuck in yeah. people's memory. And I think I'm old enough to have caught the tail end of that. wasn't right. born at that time, just mm. after. But that music was still being spoken on, mm. uh, sung, and these things were being discussed, and it was all new. We really do have to discuss uh, the role that the art plays in, in, in political situations Look, like um, that. I, mean, I know that artists very, try today to very, do it. Very, very, Not very good, no, to be very, honest. But back then they back were. Back then, for example, you had people like Andonis Samarakis writing Zititelpis, uh, stories about people's alienation and loneliness during the Hunda. Mm. And these are things that we studied at Greek school and were amazing. I actually had the honour of meeting him, and I said to him, oh, wow. I grew up, wow. and my understanding of what the Hunda was like and living under it was from you. Yeah. Yeah, I just found, uh, you know what, I'll open up a, a different can of worms if I open this, but we have to we have to definitely okay. discuss it. 
But speaking of... Um, the Kunda? No. Okay. No. What are we no. speaking of? Uh, speaking of um, issues confronting uh, issues. Uh, our, our community, like it did back then, mm. this one here, probably not at the same level, but it has caused a bit of a stir. And it's uh, this is um, His Eminence, Makarios, his Archbishop of, uh, of Australia. And quite recently, um, the subject, uh, not this only is, he... Sorry, this is our beloved Archbishop Makarios in vampire slaying mode. You can see that he is ready. <laughs> you know, he's giving that look askance at the vampire saying, out of my way, I am coming. I lifted this picture mm. straight from the ABC uh, website. This is the picture that they used um, in their recent article. Oh, thank you not to use those dirty words on this program. <laughs> <laughs> but we should actually explain the it a bit. BBC is acceptable. CBC is acceptable. Well, not the we ABC. don't use the A word on the show. Okay. <laughs> well, so we should actually clarify this. So there was, a, it was last week, wasn't it, where the ABC uh, really, um, produced an article uh, where they talk uh, about the, um, the church uh, and the mismanagement of uh, St. Basil's that would have led to that, that led to the, the deaths there right and it was a in my opinion a very badly written article where they actually correlate uh, money that was supposedly not um, given to the organisation or increased rents paid from St. Basil's to the church with in, which indirectly led to these uh, these deaths and then they decided to throw in the article some uh, uh, something about his um, vestments and costs there, as well as his very expensive caprice that he's driven around in. Uh, I'll give you my take on it, and I know that you've got uh, a, a take as well. But um, when I read it, and um, and I'm not a particularly uh, religious person. The uh, beard sort of belies <laughs> that okay. statement. <laughs> The, the, your your beard oozes, oozes spirituality. Well, it's spirituality. Well, you know, I'll take that as a compliment. Let's but not go talk about the mustache, <laughs> but the beard certainly. <laughs> but for me, if you're going to actually uh, talk about that, if you're, going, if you're going to make the cast those aspersions, and those aspersions were cast in the article, you know, if not directly, definitely heavily implied, then you have to back it up with some evidence, right? Uh, and there was nothing there. There was nothing that said that you know uh, in that article that mentioned how um, uh, those finances directly led to those particular deaths. It was just pure, unless, guess what, uh, church is just some funneling money from this poor, um, uh, uh, That's you know, a great word for an aged care facility. Isn't it? And, uh, and basically uh, funnel money out and because they're too busy, you know, in their ivory towers, and they've let that that institution go to the go to ruin, and that's the reason why those people died. And 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 here's some evidence to prove that this is his car, this is his vestments. Yeah. So, uh, but that then that that then led to um, a response, and the church uh, did respond to that article, yes, right? They did. Yeah. Now uh, I know based on the recent article I read, uh, the ABC contacted you. I was one you. of the people interviewed. One of the people yeah. interviewed. Well, it's, and uh, so, what? Firstly, your thoughts on the article. Secondly, uh, the interview. How did that go as well? So let's okay. so let's let's give us your uh, your opinion on things. I think because you're a little more to the, on the ground with regards to this issue than I am. Like the uh, like uh, Alexander Vabunoti who's a snake. Sock puppet. Yes. Slithering on the ground. <laughs> okay, let's not join any comparisons to him sa- and yourself. Snakes were sacred in ancient Greece. They were. You had temple snakes. Like the ones on that? You were not, they were not feared the way that we fear snakes. Mm. That's because they didn't have any taipans in ancient Greece. <laughs> now, there were some snakes on uh, the archbishop's uh, oh, there crozier. Too. That's called a crozier. Let me, His pimandoriki uh, ravdos. So there you go. Mm. Now, I've got various takes. And the first point I'd like to make is this. We do want our institutions to be run properly and openly and fairly and efficiently. Mm. Okay? You mentioned that. goes too. without saying. Mm. And when something is wrong, we want to know about it. Mm. And we know what you're going to do about it. Yeah. That's important. Mm. What happened at St. Basil's during the crisis with so many deaths was a terrible thing. Mm. We need to get to the bottom of yeah. how that happened. There were a lot of 
things that happened in the meantime can, uh, which created a concatenation of circumstances which makes it unclear mm-hmm. what's happened. But whoever is responsible, whether it's the church, whether it was the management at the time, whether it was the federal or state government intervention in the meantime, or mm-hmm. everybody needs to take responsibility for acts or omissions which led to those deaths. Mm. That is non-negotiable. I say this and I believe it. I don't care who is responsible. If you are responsible, you need to shoulder that responsibility. Mm. Okay? Sounds fair. But I don't believe that that article was intended to do that. No. Because this article focuses on one very controversial point, and that's the point that upon arrival here in Australia, Mm. our Archbishop, who was received with a great amount of hope Mm. and happiness... Mm. This was a new day for the church in Australia. The previous regime had stagnated. The previous regime had become increasingly isolated and remote from everyday Greek Australians. This was a chance to revitalise that section of the Greek community, Mm. make the church relevant, have it reach out, and people Mm. had great high hopes, and they still do. Mm. It emerged that the Archdiocese had purchased a property Yes. in an expensive part of Sydney overlooking the bay mm-hmm. and that they had purchased that property mm. for $6.5 million. And then all hell broke loose. Mm. Why have we purchased it? What do we do? Now, for me, the optics of it, what you think about it, each person's got their own opinion. Yeah. For me, that's an acquisition of the church. Mm. They've bought this place. They could sell it tomorrow at a profit. Mm. They may decide to keep it. That's their business. Mm. That doesn't really concern me. Mm. Originally, the Archbishop was not living there. The Archbishop was living in the Archdiocese. Mm. The Archdiocese now is scheduled for demolition and renovation, Mm -hmm. so he will no longer be able to live there, and his bishops asked him to live there in the apartment temporarily Mm. until they can finalise the official Archdiocesan residence. Mm. The Church has said that that apartment was never bought under the intention that that would be the official Archdiocesan uh, residence. They say that it's an investment property. Now, whether it is, whether it isn't, I don't know. I'm in the position to say, and I don't really care Mm. because my spiritual requirements Mm. are irrelevant to that acquisition. And you can have your own opinion, and that's fine. Mm. What the ABC is trying to do is the ABC is trying to say that monies, federal funding to Vasiliada Nursing Home in Faulkner Mm. was used to purchase that apartment. Yeah. And that's something that they haven't backed up with evidence. That's right. And I don't know whether it was or not, and I have no way of knowing, neither do any of us, Mm. because we're not across the financials of St. Basil's and of the time, and we're not across the financials Mm. of the church. Mm. What I do know is that around about the same time, the Archbishop also took $5 million Mm -hmm. of Archdiocese money Mm -hmm. to bail out St. John's school Mm. in Preston because that loan was due and the banks were about to foreclose. Wow. And he was faced with a decision, do I close this school Mm. because it had declining numbers, there was neglect there, Mm. or do I save the school by paying out the loan, investing in the education of children and trying to build up the profile of the school? Yeah. And ultimately he chose the latter. Yeah. So he picked $5 million from wherever it was sitting and I don't know where that was, Mm -hmm. and he paid out the loan Mm. And that school survived and that school is flourishing Yes, a year later, mm. which is a big thing. That's something the ABC didn't talk about. No. Okay? The it's ABC, not juicy enough. No. They, they, they make this, and that's, this is the problem. Ask your question. It is a legitimate question. Mm. And I would be interested to hear what the answer is. Yeah. Okay? Totally agree. But when you're asking the question, mm. and not only that, in your subsequent report, Mm. which was the, the uh, report where I was interviewed along with another um, other people in the community, they accept that what they've said is a fact. Yeah. So what do you think about the fact that, and yeah. it's not a fact, it's an allegation, yeah. and it's an unproven allegation, and you've provided no evidence. Yes. And in the meantime, while you're making this allegation, you mention that someone, an unnamed source, mm. states that his vestments, which are there, yeah. cost $30,000. Mm. Now... Being a man of sartorial, if you like, interest, yeah. <laughs> I know that vestments don't cost 30000 You can be dripping with bling and they still don't cost 30000 Yeah, And they say this. They say, 
Archbishop Makarios goes around wearing his blingy 30 grand ceremonial robes. Yes. Whereas Archbishop Stylianos' predecessor walked around wearing a simple black cassock. Mm. Now, you can read that, and if you don't know anything, you'll say, oh, that's terrible. Mm. What's wrong with this guy? Look at him. I thought he was a vampire slayer. He's not, obviously. <laughs> Note to the ignorant. First of all, they're not called ceremonial robes. They're called liturgical vestments. Mm-hmm. And if you as a journalist don't know, can't use the correct terminology, it means you haven't researched the topic, means you don't know anything about the topic, and you're just being sensational. Okay. Sensational is the key word. So who is this person that states that the vestments cost 30000 Yeah. Is this person a registered valuer? Mm. Is this person an expert on church liturgical vestments? Mm. Is this person a sartorial expert like myself? <laughs> we don't know because we haven't been given the You're opportunity. Right. You're it right. It could be Kira Maria. Yeah. And it probably was Kira Maria because, because anyone who understands anything about the orthodox practice, is that all bishops wear garments, liturgical vestments, inside church when they're performing the liturgy. When they're outside, what do they wear? Black cassock. That distinction was not made. That journalist was not across that piece of information Mm. because that journalist did not do her research. She did not know what she was reporting on. So that's point A. Point B, which is ancillary to that, is this allegation that the apartment that was bought in Sydney, mm. cost three million to renovate. Mm. I want to know where this figure was apply, was taken from. Is that one of those sources, some token Greek guy on the street, who was asked? Because who was asked, and how do we arrive at that figure? And on what evidence do you base that? Mm. If it is, oh, I spoke to a token Greek because all these Greeks are the same. Mm. Well, then that's not good enough. That's not proper journalism. No. Then you have the allegation that the uh, Archbishop Dry is driven in a costly car. Yeah. And it emerges that that car, which is eight years old, is valued at about 26 grand. About 26 we found and out, a yeah. a friend of mine from uh, Sydney, <laughs> one Mr. Peter Papoulilis, <laughs> mentioned that we should all have a whip around to buy the Archbishop a decent car because we can't have him being driven in something so petty and old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and well, yeah. um, if it, people are watching want to contribute to the fund, you can call Mr. Peter Papoulilis and please... Give generously. (laughs) But jokes aside, I found this disturbing for this reason. I don't think, in my personal opinion, and I stress this is my personal opinion, as a member of the Greek community, Mm. that we were taken seriously enough. No, you're right. I think that there is this innate Anglo-Saxon, if you like, demeaning attitude towards us that when scandal happens, we can't just focus on the issues. And issues are important. I stress again, we need to know what happened. Everyone does. It's an Australian issue. We need to know there needs to be transparency. But the fact that you go and do this and you indulge in what we call in Greek kutsubolia shows that what you're actually trying to do is you're trying to demean the entire community, not only of believers, Mm. but of all the Greek community around Mm. this by demeaning us, showing us as corrupt, silly and petty Mm. and for me that's offensive because i think that if we were talking about corruption in a mainstream institution Mm. the journalists would have been very careful before they published yes they would have done their research yes they would have been across all the issues pertaining to the subject and not indulge in what i and that was my issue when i read what i read yeah not indulge very sloppy it was just very very sloppy. sloppy in my opinion because we're not important enough for yeah. them to spend research Correct. To, yeah. to put things in context. Yeah. And I will give you an example. You get the second piece written by uh, Shaborn Marin, mm-hmm. which is a piece designed to ask the question, what do Greeks think about the original report? <laughs> yeah, that's the, one that I, that's the one that this was the picture of. Yeah, and that's, that's good. And I spoke to the uh, journalist. She's very pleasant. Mm-hmm. And I said a number of things to her. Mm-hmm and I waited for the article to be published. Mm. The day that the article's published, she gives me a call. Yes. And she says, no, she gave me a call to start off with, and she said, are you a lawyer? I said, yes, I am. Mm. She said, okay. So full disclosure, I'm a lawyer for my sins. Sorry. <laughs> Next, she calls me on the day the article's published and says, I've received an email from a, a member of the Greek community saying, oh, that you are on the board of St. Basil's. Yes. Full disclosure, I have been 
appointed as one of the newly appointed members of the board of St. Basil's Faulkner in order to get that institution back up and running and where it should be. Mm. Okay, guys, that is a fact. I'm a newly appointed board member. I said to her, yes. She said, well, we need to say this. And uh, in my mind, I'm thinking, you're a journalist. <laughs> you spoke, I gave you an interview, and yeah. not once did you ask me no, who I am. No, she didn't, did she? Or check my identity. No. Or question my motivation. Or why should she be interviewing you in, you in the first place? All these things. So my point is, very pleasant woman. I've read her articles in on the Religion and Ethics Report in the past, and they're very good, and I enjoy them immensely. Mm. But if you're just going to take people on face value... And why would you take me on this <laughs> des enfants? Although she's never met me in person and I refuse to supply with a photo because I didn't want to scare her. <laughs> it's, it's the same kind of thing. Who are your sources? Why, how do you check on their credibility? Mm. That, but I think that her article was well written because she allowed various people to say various things. This is the second one. The second one. The second one, right? Although you question how it starts. The article starts with one lady stating... Yeah, that yeah. she doesn't go to church and she hasn't been to church for years. Yeah, and, uh, I noticed that too. Yeah, so she hasn't been to church for years. So you've already coloured it. You've already given And the reason given why she context. hasn't been to church for years, Peter, is because apparently a priest one day got up in the church and said, uh, when you die, make sure you leave all your property to the church. Yeah. And she was disgusted. So according to her, she's a practising Orthodox Christian, but she doesn't go to church. Mm. She hasn't been for decades. Mm. And... I've never had that experience at church. Mm. I'd like to see our priests try to make the people in our parish leave their properties to the church. I don't mm. think that's going to happen. Mm. But I, I respect that she claims that that's her experience and that's okay. That's fine. But then you ask this question. What qualifications does a person mm. who has not been to church for decades mm. have to comment on today's church? Yes. To comment on an archbishop who's only been here for two years? Yeah. I'm not sure... That that's the correct person to no, speak to. Yeah. And what relevance does it have in putting it at the and beginning of I your article? I wasn't sure what relevance that had. For me, that predisposes the reader yes. to have a certain attitude correct. towards the institution that's and the community. Right. That's right. So the other two people that were interviewed, one of them is my good friend Nick Trakakis, who mm. is a lecturer in philosophy at Australian Catholic University. Oh, he was, that's right. I read that And article. he is also yeah, a yeah. former student graduate of St. Andrew's Theological College. Yes. Now, he was his piece was a very critical, very strident piece against the church. He rails against authoritarianism. He rails against the fact that, according to him, the church has a stranglehold over the community mm -hmm. and that there's no room for dissent. Mm. I respect his opinion. Mm. I Nick has left the church. He's been outside the church for about a decade. Mm. Um, he that That's his opinion. Yeah. That's how he saw things. I think that Shaborn Marin, by providing that opinion, mm -hmm. even though Nick is no longer part of the church community, mm. is at least providing some balance. Yeah, okay. Fotis Kapetopoulos, who uh, is a Neos Cosmos stalwart, also an advisor on multicultural affairs and multicultural activities and mm. is across many, many disciplines, provided a completely different view. And his view was that we aren't just as Greeks a church community. Mm -hmm. Not all Greeks are Orthodox. Yeah. Not all Orthodox Greeks belong to the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese. Yes. No, there's the split between Kinotis and churches. There's yes. other micro things. That's right, yeah. And that was designed to explain to this woman and to the f and to the entire mainstream public we're a lot more diverse yeah. than appears. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes, the majority of us subscribe to the Greek Orthodox Church and we go to weddings, funerals and these kind of things. Mm. Across that spectrum, there are many different views, and there are other organisational institutions which cover people, and they belong to those. Mm. I didn't find a problem with that. Mm. He said that we shouldn't call the Archbishop the leader of our community because there are all these other groups as well. That's his opinion. I respect that. It's a reasoned opinion. It's an opinion which makes sense for a lot of people. Yeah. And I think that was good that he was given the opportunity to posit that. I was asked various things. I discussed my criticism of the standard of journalism of the original article. Yeah. Um, Good. A paragraph of that was put in there because obviously you can't, when you're interviewing many people, you can't reproduce everything verbatim. No, we can't. No, and I did right. say that I felt that we were being targeted 
unfairly mm. because in my opinion we weren't being we weren't being the issue wasn't being discussed responsibly with enough mm. depth because of all these other silly basically smut that was introduced into the original argument yeah and I didn't accept that I also said this that ours is a culture of criticism yeah and within our own community this issue has been agitated and discussed yeah in the papers online everywhere and I said that we don't blindly accept what our leaders tell us mm. and we subject them to criticism and mm. I think that's true. Mm. I don't think any of us is afraid to question or to discuss within the communal sphere any of the issues which pertain to well, us. We do it all the time. I, I, yeah, okay. Um, all right. Yeah, I, yeah, you okay. meet one Greek, there are three different opinions. Yeah, you're right. That we're, we are big like that. And the right? reason why I wanted to make that point, Peter, is because there is this perception that there is this Greek Orthodox Church which sits on top of everything, mm. which in which according to the mainstream narrative which appears to be emerging, stifles us all, yeah. does not allow us to develop, and which controls our lives. And I don't think that's actually true. No, it's not. It's not I true don't at all. I think it's true. No, no, it's not true at all. There are many though, Dean, who would be averse to questioning um, figures well, of authority. No, 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 but some, or, some or, people or even capitulating in some sort of some way. Some people subservient like to do that. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, and especially through our radio and through our print media, mm. there is a robust culture yes, of criticism. Yes, a hundred percent. You open the Nels Cosmos every day, yeah, or Tri Weekly, which is when it comes out, or mm. the other Greek newspapers, mm. and there are letters there, and people are discussing the issues of the day. Yes, and all these things are yes. getting agitated. Mm. Okay, yeah, that is a fact. Yeah, no one is. There is not this thing. And it's healthy, right? It's important. It's important. It's we healthy. We need to subject our leaders to criticism. Correct. We need to subject them to more criticism. Yeah. yeah. Whoever they may be, secular and religious. Yes. And that was Agreed. the point that Fortis made. That we also have secular leaders. We mm. have leaders, presidents of Greek communities, mm. presidents of brotherhoods. Yeah. Their vision, their approach, yeah, their uh, tactics, everything has to be questioned yeah. because this is our future. We live mm. in this community. So that was what I discussed and the other thing that I found interesting was this not just the responses of the people who were interviewed but the responses of the Greek community in general mm. and this is where I found some interesting and worrying points right the phenomenon of self-hatred and self-loathing every time the dominant culture raises an issue and tries to demean you what do you mean by that for example, on the issue of the $3 million renovation, I remember speaking to one lady who was railing online saying, see, see, corruption, we're all terrible, we're this. My point is this. Why do you accept it as fact just because the ABC has made this allegation? Yeah. Now, it could be a fact. It could be a fact. Mm. But it's an unsubstantiated allegation Mm. No evidence has been provided to propagate it. Mm. Why do you accept it as a fact? What is it about your conception of the mainstream that causes you to capitulate and pander and accept everything they tell you as gospel? For me, that's a worrying point because when the mainstream does that, mm. they erode your pride or your understanding mm. of yourself mm. as an ontology. And what they're doing is they're defining your identity for you. Mm. They are shaping your Greek identity into the way they want it to be. Mm. Now, their agenda is not our agenda. Our agenda is generally thrive and survive. Yes. Okay? As a community integrated within the Australian polity, mm. which has its own distinct culture and history. Mm. There's something else, because it appears to me that every time they deal with us, they have to compartmentalise, they have to define us, mm. which is why it's very easy for them to try and present the Archbishop and the Church as the ecumenical arbiter of all things Greek in Australia. Mm. And I'll remind you that the Turks did as well. Yes. During the Ottoman Empire, yes, they made right. the patriarch responsible for all of the That's Greeks. That's right. You're absolutely and right. And he was yeah. answerable. You're absolutely right with that. Because he's easier to control. Yeah. Because he's the one-stop shop. You can go to him yeah. and get your job done. Mm. He's answerable. Mm. And I see that the, the way the mainstream sees us, the way they try and define us, stereotype us, put us into moulds and, and, and boxes, is the same. What do you mean by mainstream, though, Dean? Now we sort of, it sounds like we've sort of expanded from the ABC and we're just, we're talking about, we're talking about government, we're talking about mainstream but, but it society. Happens, it or? happens all the time. And I mean, on a, on a very theoretical basis, and you'll say, well, it's obvious how else would it be done. 
you look at our brotherhoods. Now, yes. you, you've been involved in community politics. Yes. And I, I've served various boards of those institutions. True. All yeah. those institutions have constitutions. Yes. Oh, rhyming. <laughs> those constitutions are in the legal form, which is prescribed by who? The government. The laws of the land. Mm. Automatically, the way that you organise yourself mm. is controlled and defined by them. Yeah, but the same thing's done in Greece. No. They've got constitutions in Greece, don't they? Greece. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm saying, it's pretty much the same thing. Okay. Uh, if I go to Greece and speak now, to a Greek, hang on, if I go to Greece and speak to a Greek, half the time he will actually start quoting articles of the constitution to me as well, even if it's a Greek from Germany or if it's a Greek from Greece. Or then they go, oh, da 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 being on my, they're all the same. No matter where you go, they all look at, you know, uh, articles the of constitution. Peter, is that those articles are created by Greeks for Greeks. These articles, which determine how we conduct ourselves right. and how we what what relationship we have with the outside, are determined by somebody else. That's the difference. The arbiters of Hellenism in this country are not the Greeks. It's the mainstream, which tells us how we present ourselves as Greeks, which defines our Greekness for us. And you see that with grants. You want to apply for a grant? You've got to fit the criteria. Yes, you have to fit the criteria. And this year, everyone's applying for a grant because there's a lot of money so that we can get, uh, especially for the 200 years of the Greek yes. Revolution activities. Mm. Now, I want to have a 200-year Greek Revolution activity. What can I do? Can I do whatever I want? No. I'll go on the website. I will look at the criteria which are set out by who? The government. Mm -hmm. And then I will fashion my mm. activities accordingly. Mm. I'm not free to do whatever I want. I mean, I am because I can fund it myself. But yes. if I want their money, their money yes. and if I want their approval, mm. I've got to play ball according to the way they shape the narrative. And isn't that fair enough? It's not a point of whether it's fair enough. It's a point of we need to understand that that is the game that is being played. And then the question is this. Do you want to define yourself according to the way they want to define you? Mm. Or is there something intrinsic within our own paradigm which exists outside of that for ourselves. Mm. Because if there is, then we should be a little bit more proactive and a little bit more strident when people try and demean us for no reason. And it is extremely acceptable when something happens which is problematic to ask the question, is this happening? If so, it's unacceptable. Mm. It is something else entirely to accept it on face value just because they're making the allegation mm. and we question the motivation of the people who are making it and their research skills for the reasons stated, okay? And more importantly, when we do this, is it because of our... W what is actually our anger about? Is it about the fact that funds may have been misappropriated or is it the fact that we look bad in the eyes of the mainstream because somehow their approval of us as an ethnic entity is important? And it's a complex ontopathology because we do play to that stereotype. Yeah, we do. That stereotype is a very difficult one. You look at the way that we are presented in comedy. Yes. We another, look at the way we're presented. Together. Well, in, in the mainstream. Yeah. You had Acropolis now. Yeah. In the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. And when since then have Greeks been on television in their own right doing their own thing for themselves? Never. Hasn't happened after that. Hmm. There is not much space for ethnics in the in the mainstream, yeah. and when there is, like the excremental superwog, <laughs> they have to be or or fat pizza. They have to be presented as violent, subversive, crazy, psychotic, easily mm. stereotyped people because the mainstream can't deal with everyday people on their terms. It has yeah. to be on mainstream's terms. Mm. These things are the things that are racing in the back of my head when I read reports like this. Again. Do your research, do your investigating journalism, present the facts, and I'll say, yeah, clean it up, fix it. Um, those responsible should justify their actions. 3,000%. Mm. I do not believe in covering up things for a moment. Yeah. I believe in openness, but also believe in preserving our dignity. We should demand. I, I totally agree with everything that you've said. Uh, for me, it was uh, making sure that if you're going to go down this path, do your job properly. Bring the evidence. Make sure that you don't present a shoddy article. 
showing to us that you don't really care about any retribution because you know you're not going to get any. Well, I don't think it even to that point. It, it even gets to that point. I think it's a subconscious thing that okay, it's just them, so whatever. Yeah, yeah. and that's that's the problem. Yeah, you if you take the time to present the evidence to show me that you understand the topic yeah. because you're a journalist, you've yeah. researched it, I'll say, okay, yeah. it's regrettable, it's a terrible yeah. situation to be in, it's a very bad yeah. thing, but I see that you know what you're doing and yeah. I can't argue with that. Yeah. So Being yeah. treated with respect is important. Mm. Loving your culture is important. Mm. Knowing how to express your culture in a dynamic mm. way without pandering to mm. the expectations of the mainstream is yeah. important because if you allow them to shape your ethnic narrative, mm. that ethnic rel- narrative will no longer have any re- uh, relevance or permanence. All right. In my opinion. Okay, well, well, very well worth the opinion. I would have loved to see how this journalist would have done um, investigating Watergate. That would have been a very interesting uh, uh, topic right there. Water gardens. <laughs> she probably would have got that wrong too. Okay, we're done. Well, we? <laughs> it didn't hurt a bit. It didn't. <laughs> no. Even after the inoculation. Do you have some stirring uh, theme music to send us out? No outro yet. No outro. Yeah. Why is this? Ah, oh, man. I just no time for an outro. Japanese elevator music? <laughs> no? You know what? I can go out with that. See, what I used to do, I did this at my daughter's baptism. There was a bit where the band wasn't ready because we had a band because we did all the proper things. Mm. And they weren't ready. Mm. And it was between the dancing and the speeches I think I was waiting for someone to come on the stage with me. It could have been the Kubaro, but the Kubaro was busy. Yeah. And there was this awkward pause where you thanked everyone mm. and you don't know what to do. You just stand around. And <laughs> so there was a great guy. That, you know the Sukiyaki song? No. Sukiyaki song was really big in the 60s uh, in Japan. There was one guy, he can't remember his name, and he died of a car crash or was it an airplane crash. Oh, okay. It was really big. And, it was ja- and they played in Japan, Jap- Japanese... Uh, Elevator music. So I did that at my daughter's baptism. I'm in love. I know you are. I could see, I could see you cringing and every single... I wasn't cringe. And every single muscle in your body clenching <laughs> in pain. And that was exactly the reaction I got from everyone that was invited. Including my theist who said, Oreo to Pima, is it to Egrap says? And then when I got the uh, video of the baptism, mm. you do, because you want a visual record yes. of all everything that transpired, mm. I played it backwards, and actually there are words of wisdom there. Oh, <laughs> backwards, though. Yeah. Fair it enough. says, it, it, actually, if you play uh, that backwards, it says, ABC, do your research, mm. stop being racist to Wogs. <laughs> it was prophetic and profound and <laughs> pathetic <laughs> okay Dean same time next week sounds good absolutely not absolutely not okay then well maybe this. okay then it just be our last show just go <laughs> <laughs>